Insight Consulting. Insight is one of the sponsors of the Business Leaders Reform. And we're very excited to have a big crowd here and to uh, have our panelists here to help celebrate the uh, five-year anniversary of the Business Leadership Forum. Since 2008, the PLF has presented panels on everything from uh, cybersecurity and healthcare reform to succession planning and today's program, which is about the Buffalo Brewing Company. So uh, we, uh, we chose this specifically because uh, we thought it would be helpful to have a brewing panel to celebrate that five-year anniversary. So we're excited to have everybody here. Uh, I wanted to quickly uh, recognize the individuals and uh, organizations that help make the DOF possible. Uh, and many of them lined up here behind me. We've got uh, Megan McDonald at Jacob Fleischman and Hugel, Paul Herlin from Lumsden McCormick. Two of them are really the, uh, the core of the BLF and do all of our heavy lifting. Uh, Ralph Banner from Banner Insurance. Mike Beecher from Escape Wire Solutions. Carrie DeGeorge representing the World Trade Center in Buffalo, Niagara. Russ Canis from the Canis Group. And we'd also like to thank uh, UB Center for Entrepreneurial Leadership, better known as CEL, who is also part of our team. So it's a big group, but we really enjoy doing this, and uh, we hope you enjoy today's show. Uh, we think that the key to these panels is really getting real-world expertise. Uh, people who know the business, and we try to recruit top-rate moderators to help with that process. Um, and we've got a great crew here today. Um, we have several cast of moderators and panelists in the audience as well. If you guys are here, we appreciate you stand up and be acknowledged. <laughs> You're all up on stage. Well, look to your right, look to your left. Somewhere there's a panelist and a moderator, and uh, you should thank them for their participation. A couple of housekeeping items. Um, our panel discussion will be just about an hour today. Uh, we're going to do a question and answer period afterwards. Uh, we'll try and answer as many questions as possible, and the panelists will also be available afterwards. Uh, for beer tasting upstairs, so you'll have a chance to continue the conversation up there. So uh, there's a large staircase right outside the main hall you came by, follow that up and straight ahead, and uh, you'll find beer tasting. Uh, I imagine it wouldn't be too difficult. <laughs> so we're looking forward to that. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. I've got the pleasure of uh, introducing uh, today's moderator, Tom McManus. Uh, Tom is the Chief Executive Officer at Kegworks, a privately held company that sells products that allow people to serve and enjoy adult beverages, from consumers in their homes, to major casinos, and everything in between. These products include draft beer dispensing equipment, bar tools and accessories, premium cocktail ingredients, and bar arm and foot rails, which I find essential. Uh, so if you need help with any of those, please see Tom afterwards. I'm sure he can give you some feedback. Um, the last four years, Kegworks has been uh, one of Western New York's fastest growing companies. Last year, Kegworks opened an award winning flagship retail location. Uh, it's the only store created just for drinkers, which I find fascinating. Um, last week, Kegworks opened a state of the art home brewing education center with the largest selection of home brewing ingredients in Western New York. So, for all you cyberologists out there, can I say that right? Sure. <laughs> go, see, go see Tom about that as well. Uh, Tom is responsible for directing corporate strategy and overall operations of the company and has led the company's growth from a six person staff to over 55 employees. Tom holds an MBA from the State University of New York at Buffalo and a BA in economics from Baldwin Wallace University in Cleveland, Ohio. He currently serves as a member of the board of directors of the Entrepreneurs Organization of Western New York. St. Joseph Collegiate Institute, Board of Trustees, and President of the St. Joe's Alumni Association. Tom's been a member of Business First 40 under 40 and has, a, has been a featured speaker at the TEDx Buffalo. So please join me in welcoming Tom Hannes. Thank you. 
craft breweries are booming. With us right now is Julia Hurts. She is craft beer program director at the Brewers Association. Good to see you, and she's joining us. Thank you for having me. So, the craft beer business has been booming a while. There is innovation in beer, full flavor in beer, no longer does a light American lager satisfy every beer lover's beer occasion. And what do you shape in terms of the popularity of craft? We're seeing a localization of beer movement. So, locally, not distributing out of the state, we're talking about new breweries, plus regional craft brewers, either regional or national distributing, putting the innovation back in beer. A lot of private companies. Yeah, a lot of private companies. What we're seeing today is not really touching 97% of the 2,500 breweries. They are not Wall Street or publicly traded. These are counterculture, counter-corporate breweries doing what they do with most of their adults. When you say that the industry has added more than 100,000 jobs in the U.S.? Yes, absolutely. How do you think? Well, especially when you have 1,100 to 2,500 breweries or restaurant breweries. So you've got a whole part-time jobs. The average craft brewer has 10 to 50 jobs per brewery, and then some many, many more. Now, I know that they're, they're real popular, but can these guys compete with the larger, more you know, deep-pocketed companies like Anheuser-Busch? Well, it's about competition and diversity, and the small brewers are filling a niche for that sort of fuller flavor that I mentioned. So there is room for more. There's more demand in the marketplace for craft beer, for small, for independent producers right now than supply. Where's, where's the money coming from? Who's the Who are the big buyers? Mostly of the big buyers, like I said. They're literally privately owned some private equity, but this is mom and pop small free business. Interesting. I know. Okay, people who do their own beer say, well, I don't know if we're ready. I know. And you do it then. Maybe you can make beer. Maybe you can make beer. Yeah. Yeah. Our prices moving up as a result of this popularity. Prices will end up certainly and continue to inch up. We're dealing with not a commodity, but agricultural products involved. So with that, you've got um, a challenge on the pricing side, for sure. Agricultural prices have gone up. Yeah. 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 So that's that, 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 that is passed on to the consumer. Yeah, it is. And taxes, I mean, you know, small brewers pay a disproportional amount of taxes compared to comparable industries, too. Why? About 40% of the cost of beer, by the way, is taxes. Because you have federal excise taxes on beer. And so it's a, it's a whole different ballgame for these small brewers to compete and thrive in this field.
There's another story we're starting here. Buffalo's Renaissance. And what could be better for a town that could usually use a drink than a beer of Renaissance? There's a lot of exciting things happening in the beer scene. Breweries growing, new ones popping up. Bar and restaurants like the Blue Mountain Pizza Plant are becoming beer destinations. New and existing retailers with huge selections, consumers, village beer merchants, Aurora Blues, industry stalwarts, triads, soda growers, continuing to grow. Some of us are lucky to be part of it and call it a job. The beauty of working in this industry is we get to be around some of the most knowledgeable, passionate, creative, entrepreneurial, and nicest people you could ever meet. And they always have a good beer. I'd like to introduce four of the best. We're honored to have them with us today. Ethan Cox, president of the Beer Works, Seth Ali, founder of New York Craft, Craft Mall, Tim Kurzak, owner of Flying Flags and Brain Company, and Dan Robinson, craft beer and port manager for Triad Street. John, can you take a couple minutes and tell us about yourselves? I'll start. Hi, um, so my name is Ethan Cox. I'm the president and I'm co founder of Community Beer Works here in Buffalo. Uh, we're a nano brewery operating over on Lafayette Avenue, uh, right across the street from San Sara and Jones Mountain, actually. If you uh, like the town of Purdue, come on down. Um, I guess, you know, how, how did I get started? This is, uh, you're going to hear this again, actually, from uh, the two of them. This is the product of a hobby god ride. Um, I, too, was once a homebrewer. I have to say once because once a person made for me, never really had a homebrew again, and you see that, unfortunately. Um, but uh, I, I was homebrewing very assiduously uh, all the way through uh, college uh, as an undergraduate, and then uh, also that was basically how I put off steam in graduate, uh, graduate school as well. Um, moved back to Buffalo in 2006 with my wife uh, with the intention of uh, starting a family. And uh, it was really with the intention of taking that PhD in litigation work you know, in the academic field. Um, my background uh, academically was in cognitive psychology. So uh, I spent most of my time in graduate school when I wasn't brewing. I'm grappling with really ridiculously, uh, impossibly unimportant problems in uh, human life processing and how we process speech. Um, I thought it was really fascinating stuff, but uh, for the most part, it doesn't have much in the way of practical application in the real world. Um, in fact, it's embarrassing because I can talk to my phone now and it understands what I'm saying. And, and, like, you don't really understand how people do that, or really how people do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I moved back here in 2006. Uh, with my academic background, it was really only one place for me to be, however, and that was UB, where I'm supposed to be a tenured professor or getting tenure about how I suppose, and uh, teaching as few courses as possible, buying out as many courses as possible, and doing all kinds of crazy research. Um, but you might, you might recall that the economy wasn't super hot back then, and so the university wasn't exactly hiring back then, and so I was lucky, actually, frankly, to find a job at Google just teaching psychology. Did that for a couple of years, but you know, in truth, my background had me, you know, wanting to do research. It wasn't fully really satisfying to me just to teach. I enjoyed teaching, it was fine, but it wasn't really where my heart was at. So I started casting around for alternative ideas, and since I was completely and utterly obsessed with homebrewing in the rest of my life, um, I kind of, you know, decided that that was something that was uh, obviously uh, strongly appealing to me and something I should turn into a business. Um, Oddly enough, I thought first of doing a really nice like beer specialty store. And while I was kind of working on that, I was going to rich and open up, so I was actually going to have to draw and board on that. Um, my next idea was a really nice Belgian themed bar. And then my chat's all bought the old Berlin's and opened up the pub, so I was like, okay, that can draw and board on that. Um, you can see I have a great mind for ideas, right? Just to them. So I uh, decided to pull up the store. Uh, got a bunch of friends together. Uh, you can hear from a couple times on this panel. Brewing really, is a very capital intensive industry. All that shiny steel and steel is the cheap. So uh, we got the resources together we could, and we put together um, and opened up two years ago our nano brewery. When I say we're a nano brewery, it's kind of funny. Uh, <clears throat> what does that mean? We produce barrel. Uh, we produce a barrel and a half of beer in a batch. Uh, so if you think of brewing, it's a batch manufacturing process. Our batch size is literally 45-ish gallons, so a ridiculously small amount of beer, and that has been, uh, as we've discovered over the two years of uh, trying to make it nearly 24 hours a day. So um, we're at the point now, two years in, that we're working on expansion. We think we can leverage the kind of capital we need to get to a brewery size like the team's got. I love the brewery. 
So, um, so uh, yeah, so um, that's kind of my background, and I'm going to move that to you today and talk about here some of my favorite things to talk about because I'm not talking about really ridiculously detailed problems in college psychology. <laughs> well, I cannot top that at all. Um, I'm Dan Robinson, I'm the craft and import manager at Tri Distributing over in Walden. We distribute uh, many different kinds of beer, and my passion is craft beer, so I get to lead that charge uh, with Christy Williams. So uh, my story is really simple. I started uh, my bachelor's degree at Niagara University and needed a part-time job. Uh, my mom did business with Triumph, and kind of got me in the door. Started merchandising, throwing cases, and breaking my back every day. Um, became a salesman, and then lo and behold, found this side of the business. Uh, it was, it was kind of a shot in the dark, and as I said in the bio, um, never drank a beer until I got this job. I drank a little bit of Bud Light, that's about it. And discovered Mr. Rusty Chain over here, and the rest is history. <laughs> now, um, now there's nothing better than, than going out talking to customers. I'm in the field every day talking to guys like, you know, Benny at BBM and, and Mike at Blue Monk and Coles. And, uh, I swear I would give you guys I have the best job in the world because you guys make it. I get to enjoy it, and talk about it, and sell it. And there's nothing better. And um, hopefully, as the industry grows, you know, try distributing grows and brings you all of you in this audience uh, some more exciting beer from here in Western New York and around the region. So thank you. Since then, I've uh, been self-employed, I've been self-employed entrepreneur over 30 years. Um, during that time, uh, I've been buying back parts of the farm, trying to bring it back, uh, going to the diesel mechanic business, uh, mini storage business, document storage and construction business, and uh, helping storage. <coughs> now, now I'm in Walter, I'm in Walston. Uh, I became interested in Walton in 2011 when I attended a, a NOFA conference. Uh, it was a segment on Farm to bakery that I was very interested in. I was going to go see the organic grains and try to uh, process it and sell right to the bakeries in New York. And uh, the facilitator at that time had uh, one sentence uh, saying, "If there's any uh, entrepreneurs in the uh, in the world, there's a need for uh, malting uh, grains for the brewing industry." Uh, so shortly after that, uh, was maybe minutes after it was over, I. And it's two and a half years later, I've traveled to China, Europe, uh, all over the U.S. researching uh, what equipment is available. Uh, I've been educating myself uh, in Winnipeg, uh, the Canadian Walton Barley Technical Center. They're an uh, internationally renowned uh, laboratory where they can uh, test any uh, barley uh, from anywhere in the world, create that environment, malt it, and they actually have a brew. They brew it at the end of it, but it's the second <coughs> Learning the trade. Uh, so uh, my, my goal uh, is to grow local grains uh, and uh, malt local grain and sell it to these fine brewers. Uh, there, there's a overwhelming need. Uh, by the end of this month, I should be up and running. It's been a two and a half year process and I've designed some equipment that's really nothing off the shelf uh, available for malt. So there's floor malting, there's uh, Malting. Uh, there is, uh, there's no rules. There's people doing they're, they're malting in different ways. They've been around for 6,000 years. Uh, it's one of the oldest trades uh, that's been over there, I believe. Uh, there's bread crumbs before malted bread crumbs. It's not a question of the day. Anyways, the challenges are going to be uh, growing this product in years, growing the grains that we need. There's a lot of challenges. The varieties that are not uh, available for our region just yet. And I've been doing a lot of research. Uh, this summer, this spring, they couldn't even put the spring varieties in because it's just too wet. So we couldn't do it in Jensen County. And we're working with them on the But we just have an environment here that's not friendly to uh, this, this specialty grain, which is different than the wheats and corn and, and other uh, grains that are growing in our area. Uh, just uh, we will get into that a little bit later. But, uh, uh, yeah. I've been brewing beer since before most of you were born. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
perspective on how that's gone. I mean, we're talking about what a huge growth we've seen in, in craft beer and beer in general. Um, when I started brewing beer in 1981, there were fewer than 50 breweries in the entire country. Three years ago, there were 50 breweries exactly in New York State alone. By the end of the year, there will be 151 brewery licenses issued in New York State. That's a major cultural shift. So from back when, you know, in the olden days, uh, when there was essentially one style of beer available, North American light lager style beer, insert major national brand name here. Uh, and that was the one style that was available. So whether it was made in Milwaukee or St. Louis or Colorado, it, it was very similar in style. Now, go to any grocery store. Go to Tops, go to Wegmans, go to Consumer Beverages, and look at what's available on the shelf. And it's, it's tremendous. You know, I started brewing because there wasn't beer out there that had flavor, body, color. There wasn't a reason to drink, for me personally, there wasn't a reason to drink the beers that were available. Now, you don't have to have a brew. It's a lot of fun. Um, to touch on what Ethan was saying, well, once you get into the brewing business, you kind of lose the ability to homebrew. The single biggest reason you lose that ability is because you're really not home very often. <laughs> so, you know, the first word homebrewing is home. So, <laughs> um, so it's, it's been a great ride. It's, uh, it's a great business. Uh, as you can tell by just looking at the number of people in this room, people are interested in it. It's hard work, it's interesting work, it's constant work, um, but it's, you know, if you like it, if it gets your geek on, then, you know, it's a great job. Now, I need to get a bottle of water. Can you guys have something to drink? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
fine there in Niagara Falls, Ontario, but it's still closer than Washington State or uh, China or you know, Germany. So we, we know what we can to, to do the local thing um, as local ingredients become available, as Ted has Wall will be buying some, as you know, hops are available and their pelletized will be buying some. Um, it's a commitment we've made to the local business. It's not always the least expensive. Uh, it doesn't always get you the best buzz. It doesn't necessarily sell another keg or bottle of beer. Um, but at the end of the day, it helps somebody else stay in business so that they can spend their paycheck on your beer.
that's the big thing. They're, you know, unfortunately to an extent going after the big guys, but they're doing it for each other. They're drinking each other's product, and, and as you'll probably hear Ethan talk, and the same thing with Tim, the collaborations they do together. It makes the beer industry that much better. And from a distributor standpoint, it's really easy to work with these gentlemen. They don't target each other's lines. They don't, they don't target each other's business. They want to grow the business as a whole. And um, I don't think there are very many industries in the world that do that. And we are in one of the best ones that, that allow each other, that allow for all of us to grow in one synonymous direction. Yeah. Imagine if this was a, a talk about the steel industry and you would have uh, Bethlehem Steel and Japanese Steel Concern, Ryerson, and you know, different steel companies. Four different reps sitting up here and a bunch more in the audience. And, hey, let's go get a beer afterwards. No, hey, while you're up here, I'm going to go try and steal some of your customers. Mm -hmm. So that's that's great. We've done some collaboration groups for Buffalo Beer Week. Um, we do uh, code tastings, code tap takeovers with different brands of other breweries. We're going to have a beer with Mr. Russo last night. We brewed with Noah from Pearl Street. We brewed with Rudy and Ethan. Um, you know, really, is it really good to want? <laughs> uh, it's just, it's fun to do, it's fun to see how they do theirs, it's fun for them to see how we do ours. Um, in some cases we share suppliers, we'll, you know, whatever. It's just, you need some yeast, here you go. You need the sack of grain, you know, bring them back over when you, when you get your order. You know, it's just, it's the way that it's always been. Hopefully it will always be that. Yeah, I, I hope it always will be too, because I'm, I'm a little newer to the industry too, that, that you are, but I'm struck, certainly, by the fact that there's an amazing amount of cooperation rather than uh, litigation there in the craft beer community. Uh, from, from doing collaboration groups to uh, selling each other supplies when you're tight. Um, these guys uh, were very kind to us early on when, uh, when we started out. We were actually building our grain on a home grain mill, a little tiny home grain mill with a drill attached to it. Um, that mill, you know, that mill did its work, man. I mean, we put tons and tons and tons of all through that mill, and one day it said, I quit. I mean, we've gone through two drills already. What do we do about that? This was the mill. It was probably like, I'm not, I won't grind another thing. And we, we, we deconstructed it, and in fact, the rollers were pretty much smooth at that point. I mean, there wasn't much left of that mill. Uh, so we started getting one fabricated, and we started, you know, researching, oh, we need a mill. I'm like, now? <laughs> and where did we get one, right? We started figuring it out. It wasn't going to happen. Um, so while I continue to contact people who fabricate mills and stuff like that, uh, Rudy called up Tim down at Five Mines, our head brewer. He called up Tim down at Five Mines and said, hey, um, I don't suppose we could, I don't know, use your mill to, to mill our brains. And Tim was like, oh yeah, that's no problem. And he was like, no, but for the next month, maybe two, <laughs> or, or two and a half. <laughs> so, uh, and, and, and we did. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't the greatest fun ever. Loading off the grain in the van, driving over fly wise and taking the mill out, milling stuff, cleaning up after ourselves since we're good guests, I think. Um, and then taking it back to the brewery and then starting our brew day, right? And add like an hour and a half to our brew days. So it wasn't it wasn't awesome. But it was awesome because we would have otherwise been out of business. <laughs> so, you know, that's the kind of collaboration and, and, and lack of competitive spirit, I guess, that you probably don't see in too many other industries in the country. You go to the craft brewers conference, and uh, it's, a, it's 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 exactly what you might expect. There's an awful lot of beer, there's an awful lot of brewers hanging out, networking, and chill out, you know, chill out. Now it may be that, that there's a bit more competitive spirit in the back office, you know, the accounting staff or the marketing staff. You know, it's quite the same way as the, as the brewing staff does, but certainly not the brewing sport. We just have a great appreciation for each other's beers, and we spend a lot of time drinking each other's beers and talking about each other's beers, and it's really hard to just have somebody to back us that. As a startup, uh, I haven't been able to collaborate with what you to do yet, but uh, I had Tim at my place, and he was offered to help out malting my first batches, and I uh, had many other breweries uh, do the same. Uh, but uh, in the, the malting side of things, there's a this new, uh, since this is a whole new industry,
<laughs> State government seems to be catching on to the impact that the growing industry can have. And it's actually helping, which is very unlike the other state, considering it's just considered the hardest state in the need to uh, do business in. Can you guys talk about the impact of the farm brewers license, uh, Carmel Bill, and some of the other legislation? And then we'll circle back.
helping you grow your business. So they should really, you know, be your papa. They should, I don't want to say own you, but they, they really have grasp and control of you. And uh, when the bill was passed, we hadn't even opened flying pies in there. And I started talking with Assemblyman Schiminger, and I said, well, what about a small brewery? How could that ever possibly muster the legal wherewithal to get out if there was a problem? So we went to work, and worked, and worked, and worked. So, 95, uh, so 19 years later, we have a car on it. Now, when we signed a contract with the distributing company, Mr. Dukeley shook my hand, he looked me in the eye, and he said, I know what you're going through, I know what you're thinking, I know that you're you know, talking about this, and I know, you, you, know you, you don't agree with this, but let's do it this way. If you feel you'd be better off somewhere else, we don't want to restrict your growth. We would like to see you go. We would like to see you grow. But we're going to do such a great job for you every day that you'll never leave. And I will tell you today, we'll never leave. It's eight years later. We're still growing. We're still going. Thank you very much. Wow. You're welcome. <laughs> 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 yeah, the good news is that brewers uh, and breweries and fans of craft beer happen to also be generally pretty active people. They also tend to be uh, an age demographic that's very tech savvy. 
So when the Brewers Association sent out, you know, the East called the Brewery to say, hey, this is a big deal. Maybe you should contact anybody you know, especially the farmers you're giving grain to, but also the people who buy your beer, and get them to weigh in while there was a, a, a sort of moving uh, the in period for that, for that legislation for those, for those laws. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people wrote to the FDA and said, hey, this seems like a bad idea, this seems like it'd be bad for my favorite brewery, or this seems bad for my business, or whatever. Um, enough so that like, they backpedaled faster than you would possibly imagine anything to have in Washington at all. Um, and so they're, they're, they're restructuring now. So, I mean, thankfully, we have uh, an industry where our customers are really, you know, active people. And when we tell them, hey, this is what, what's happening, can you help us out? Um, they do. Um, so we're, we're very grateful for that. And we're grateful that the FDA was actually listening. That's pretty cool, too. I guess. Yeah, good one. She was in Saranac yesterday. Was, uh, yeah, she, yeah, she was out and kind of, he's, he's, he's been on tour. So, you know, really, really against it. Which, you know, which I think would be great. Um, I would just add too, real quickly, just in terms of the state supporting this. I mean, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of opinions you can have about Cuomo in a lot of different areas, and those are all fine. But when it comes to beer, he's been incredibly awesome to us. He's really changed the culture down at the SLA. Uh, so two weeks ago, at um, the New York State Brewers Association had sort of a yearly uh, gathering of sorts, and the president of the New York State Brewers Association is guy named Dave Kaleski. He's the president of Empire Brewing over in Syracuse. Uh, great guy, and he's been, you know, he's been down in Bay and Albany for years, uh, trying to, to get things to happen for the industry in New York City. And he said uh, the other day, he's like, it's weird, and I call up Dennis Rosen at the, uh, at the SLA, and, and I talk to him, and it's not a big deal. It's like, it's like they want to help. But in, in, the brewing brewing industry, industry, in the brewing industry, that's a really funny joke. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Dennis Rosen, and I spoke to him. Yeah, <laughs> So, I mean, right now, the, the legislative, or uh, really more the executive environment in New York State is, is very good for beer, also for wine and spirits more generally. Uh, for most of doing a lot of stuff. Um, they, they just had a summit in Albany where they had representatives from wine, beer, cider, and, um, what am I forgetting? Uh, meat, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Spirits. Spirits, spirits. 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 Um, they all got together and basically he was there like, what do you guys need? What do you want? And he was told him, and he kind of turned around and told the staff members to make it, make it so. Um, that's awesome. Uh, we're trying to take as much advantage of that as we can for the last class, because of course, we won't have to do it. Hopefully, a few years from now, we're having another farm on the ball with the stem right now. Oh, uh, yeah, we just got to do it. Ted, you touched on it. Beer tourism is actually a thing. People visiting the area would just put their dress in the floor. Snapping on a visit to a brewery or two um, as part of a vacation. What can we do in Washington New York to make it more of a beer destination like Port of Long Island or Ashton, Ashton, North Carolina? Well, the first thing is to do something. Personally, I think it's already happening. Um, I was given the chance to take a little tour last week and went to some of the, some of the spots in the Midwest and you can find. Um, some of the nice regional breweries at Commerce Brewing, I had 500 people there on a Thursday night just to come and eat and drink. I think you're going to see that coming uh, with Tim's new building and tasting rooms, uh, you know, the big dish brewing company coming out with their own room. You're going to see a lot of that stuff happening where people are going to come across the border. They're going to come across from central New York, from PA, and it's just going to blow up from there. And they're going to want to come, they're going to want to enjoy beer right out of the tank, through the freshest beer possible. And, and then they're going to be really picky on stores and stuff, but I think that's what's going to happen. You know, you, you see the success of some other brew pubs around the area, and <coughs> once these two breweries get out, especially um, with the fresh beer and stuff, they're going to create a big buzz. They're going to create a big industry um, in downtown Buffalo. And what's nice, too, and I, you know, Tim mentioned earlier, I'm going to steal his thunder a little bit, but it doesn't hurt any of the local businesses. It actually brings so many, so much foot traffic into the area. It's going to help our local businesses grow, our local, you know, mom and pop restaurants in downtown Buffalo with all the nice beer bars on our own. It's going to allow that whole, the whole city to grow. Retail shops, you name it. Um, Kegler. Kegler, well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think it's already happening. And, and I think as people continue to build breweries, as, as people continue to invest in breweries, you're going to find that it's going to invest in what, we, what matters most, and that's the heart of Buffalo and the heart of Western. So I think it's already 
be gone in you know, a couple months, but a couple off and running, we're going to see a, a big change in lifestyle for a lot of people coming across the border and coming from outside the area. Health Head Works order three rolls of draft line, one roll of gas line, Thank you. three couplers. <laughs> um, we, we've been seeing uh, flying by some beer tourism kind of feet on the ground for close to 14 years. Our original layout, if you've been to our brewery, there's that sort of room in the middle of it, and the idea was that that would be our retail room. And there's windows all down, <coughs> two sides, so from inside that room you could see everywhere. And we could keep that space, we put a fan in that space, and the way the building is, it's a big old kind of warehousey building, and it's you can't temperate that building. It's not insulated, you can't cool it in summer, you can't heat it in winter. So we, we thought we had a nice little thing set up. We had the draft cooler in there. We had taps. We had some cups. We had, you know, this is, this is a nice little space. It'll be great. And the first people that came in for a tour, I said, okay, so we're going to start over here. And they said, well, we want to go out there. Well, you know, we don't really want to have you out there, water on the floor and all that. We don't care. We want to go out there. And that was the end of our retail space. You know, from that point on, People want to be there. They want to see where the beer is made. When people go to a winery, they go on a wine tour. They want to see the oak barrels that the red wine is aged in. They want to see the, the crush tank. They want to see the guy in the rubber boots, you know, pulling the stems out of the crusher. They, they, you know, they want to see the brewer moving the grain. Um, you know, that's what they want. Okay, you may have. Uh, so, beer tourism has been happening in Buffalo in the 14 years that we've been in business, and it's just, it's nothing but growing. And if you want to see how it, it sort of could work, go down to Larkinville on a food truck Tuesday and walk around the corner to Marinaro's, which was closed three years ago. And it was an empty, it was an old neighborhood bar that was sitting there empty. And now, it's an open, busy, thriving bar. Try and get in there on a food truck Tuesday. Ah. <laughs> It's, it's not knocking anybody down, it's bringing everybody up. I think, in a lot of ways, um, tourism, your tourism, is, is just another facet of what's, what's, what's happening with the evolving craft beer consumer. Um, the beer consumer of the 70s didn't really care uh, much about beer. I don't want to insult anybody personally, but, you know, uh, there were a lot of choices and a lot of things that I would really consider. So, um, what you see in today's consumer is they, they really want new and different experiences. Today's craft beer drinker is incredibly promiscuous, which is a real challenge for us as brewers, quite honestly. But these guys, they want a different beer every time they want a beer. And they want beer a lot. So, you know, they want a lot of different beers. Um, as a brewery, that means that you have to have your core brands, but you really also have to spend an awful lot of time making one-off patches and little, you know, Things you make because everybody always wants a new beer, and everybody actually just buys the one beer you make and drinks it for the rest of their life anymore. You just can't really find those customers as much as it uh, used to. Um, and tourism fits in with that, right? So these guys have had everything to drink in their region. They have them all. They've, they've checked them all off on the tap or whatever they use. Or they, they put them all on Facebook, and they're done. And it's unfortunate for me, right? Because I really want them to come back and drink more of our beer. Okay, we've had it all. Now, ours is your favorite, right? So come on back and just keep drinking that. But what they do rather is they either are getting involved in trading groups with people that they all hear around the country, or they travel for beer. And, you know, some people just have to travel anyway. It's <coughs> you're into what you're doing. If you're traveling for business, it's easy enough to also hit every local brewery in the area and hit the beer bars and pack your suitcase with a few bottles to send back. <coughs> or if you're really into it, you know, get some. But then there are people who make entire beer your occasions. The entire point of the travel is indeed beer. And they'll book an entire weekend around here. Um, for community beer works, and I think you would you, you appreciate this perspective too, I mean, for, for us, that's always been a huge part of the demographic that we wanted to capture and bring to Buffalo. I, I kind of thought of this brewery, um, in some respects, as something that would be uh, work towards maintaining Buffalo's name in the rest of the world and country. I, I lived outside of here for long enough to know that uh, sometimes people don't think Buffalo is as awesome as it is. I don't know if you've ever run into that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually used to spend a lot of time trying to convince people they were wrong. Like, 
then I realized that I actually would have to make up the leaving that to some extent. Mm -hmm. To keep it for ourselves. Mm -hmm. But putting us on the ground we are now and bringing that money into the area has actually, from the beginning, been a big part of what I was hoping to do with community beer works. Growing the beer scene here so that there'd be no critical mass for us to be a destination on any beer needs, beer station, map, plant. Um, that's something that I was always hoping would happen, and it seems to be happening. That, I think, is where the most interesting money is to be made. I mean, obviously, if you're at your base, it's going to be local. People who are buying beer, you know, around here, from here, in the market. It's obviously going to be way more of your, of your revenue. Um, but those people who go back out with a good impression of Buffalo's beer and of Buffalo go back out into the world and, and, and rehabilitate Buffalo to some extent in the national conversation. Um, to me, that's a, that's, a, that's a big, important victory as well. And then I add, you know, those, those Canadian dollars, uh, they shouldn't all be going into the bad Galleria. I mean, I'm glad you can go to the Bath Galleria, but I want some of that Toronto money too. So, you know, it's all your Canadian friends' house and it's down here because their craft beer industry is not growing as fast as ours. So for a few more years, we can still follow the draft. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, I think you see that Canadian dollar come over here, but it's up north in Niagara Falls. But it travels down here with some of the breweries that we have uh, popping up in downtown Buffalo. I think you're going to see Buffalo reform. Uh, I think you're going to see so many, so much of that Canadian money come through. Right now it's all in the fall. You can see I live up there. You can see it's there everywhere. And they don't want to drive. They're everywhere. <laughs> but I feel like we're going to find it down here in Buffalo. You're going to find it when the breweries open up. People are already asking the topics out there. These two gentlemen come up all the time. When I'm up there drinking at my local pub, and um, I think you're going to continue to see that just come inch a little bit south, and then Buffalo's going to be in infiltrated too, and I think you're going to see a lot of those dollars come. It's just, it's, it's a matter of time. I also think I could add to that is uh, uh, Finger Lakes Beer, or Wine Trail, and the National Wine Trail. Sorry, sorry, uh, Finger Lakes Beer Trail, Finger Lakes, uh, or Niagara Beer Trail, and just started. And uh, before to get on that beer trail, I think
you know, is, is there, you know, can you look at a chart and say, well, here's where we should be going, and this is where we should be avoiding? Uh, and the answer is sure, and it changes every week. So if you want to change your business plan every week, go right ahead. Otherwise, do what you can do, and you know, your customers will find you. Um, you can get out there and get in front of people and try and talk to people and pour them a beer and you know, try and win them over your brand. Um, but you know, to, to draw a line and say, this is where we're going and this is where the industry is going, and it's, it, it doesn't exist except on a weekly basis. Yeah, I'll agree with Tim. I mean, you, you basically shoot a dart to a dartboard to see which style is going to be hot next week. It's, it's, it's almost ridiculous, especially when you're trying to order beer. I'm trying to tell Tim what to brew, and Tim brews it, and it's like, oh, you know, not that we really have a problem with him, but, but with a no, there's a number of other breweries you do. You just don't know your style is going to be hot. But the nice thing about, you know, we talk about the 90s and how the crap bubble kind of burst. That, that bubble's not going to burst this time. That bubble's here. You might see the 3,200 breweries shrink a little bit from consolidation and just not enough beer drinkers out there. But the craft beer world is here to stay. And that's probably the, the you know, we can all take bonus in that. We can all take our lucky stars for that. Because, you know, you guys, you know, everybody in this crowd, everybody in Buffalo or the nation, you've spoken that you want good beer. And that's the trend that's going to stay, stay for the rest of, I hope, my life and my kid's life and so on and so forth. But, I also think the trend, you know, you see a lot of these seasonal beers, you see a lot of these high alcohol beers, you make a splash with, with something 12% you can only get a bottle of at your local retail. I think that's going to start to go away, personally. I think it's going to go back to what you're seeing now when you see these quote-unquote session IPAs. Guess what? Session IPA was what beer was way back when craft beer was craft beer. It was Sam Smith's. It was 5% beer. And that's where it's going to go back to. And you're going to be able to drink a lot. I think the beer consumer is going to be able to drink more because they're not getting one bottle and done. They're not going to get one pint and done. And it goes right back to the industry as a whole benefiting local communities, local cities. Because I can go to pubs, I can drink five rusty chains and be fine. I can drink five whales and be fine. And I'm still, I can still be good. And I think that's where the industry is going to go. And I think the industry is going to keep climbing up the charts going from I think it's 10% of the average now we have a little lower. Here it's only seven and a half. You'll see it going 10 and 12, hopefully 20, you know, job security for all of us. <laughs> and uh, we can go from there. But I think that's gonna, you're gonna see a lot more of that style of beer, that alcohol by volume, because that's what's gonna make people money. And I think that's where you're gonna start seeing the charts. Yeah, uh, gosh, you know what I mean? Prognostication is, is sort of fun. Um, as you guys have made clear. The fact, that, the fact that drinkers are as promiscuous as they are, um, I already kind of pointed out why, why that's a challenge. Um, it, does, it does force us as, as, as makers to uh, continually sort of adjust our production schedule and try to fit in you know, one off beers that, 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 that people are looking for. Um, and I don't see that actually changing too soon. I, I think people are really uh, discovering beer in a way that they, they never really had the opportunity to before. And Think about the beer landscape that we would have been looking at um, a little over 100 years ago, when uh, before there was all the massive consolidation. You know, you sort of didn't see um, a shelf uh, with 140 different styles of beer on it back then. Right? If you if you walked into a beer purveyor in Buffalo around the turn of the last century, I mean, the last last century, um, you know, your choices wouldn't have been a whole lot wider than they were in the 70s in a lot of respects. They they weren't great as many different kinds of styles of beer as, as, as they could. Those breweries were very traditional. They brewed the beers that they knew how to brew, and they kind of figured that to do. And the clientele was pretty much happy with that. Um, so the craft beer landscape today is dramatically different from that. We're all sort of required to expand our portfolios as wide as we can. And yet, we still need to have those mainstay beers, because we do want to attract the people who like, maybe they red by beer, or maybe they red. Those people built the brewery. We really need to have them. Um, as far as like the trends go, I mean, yeah, I do think if you know uh, what's happening in the craft beer world right now, IPAs, India Pale Ales, these beers that are relatively high in alcohol content, relatively high in bitterness, and relatively um, hop forward with a lot of hop uh, flavor and aroma, those have been the darlings of the craft beer industry for the last few years now. 
Um, they're fading, but not dropping off the radar exactly, not dropping like vapor rate, um, but they are starting to fade a little bit. They're starting to yield a few of the at least uh, two different things, both of which are variants of my king. Uh, so one of them is the India Pale Lager, IPA stands for India Pale Ale. So the India Pale Lager is one alternative that you know, every brewery seems to be trying to fit one into their production schedule all of a sudden. Um, and then what's called a session IPA, and I, I absolutely need to take at least half a second to tell you that I hate that term. You won't use it except, you know, descriptively. Um, an IPA, by definition, is something that's relatively strong in alcohol and relatively bitter. A session IPA is an IPA that is less bitter and less strong in alcohol. <laughs> Folks, it's called a pale <laughs> Don't let the marketers tell you what to drink. It's not a session IPA. It's a It's a good pale ale. Kind of pay all people want to drink right now. Anyway, those are also rising in popularity. <laughs> so if they were only call them pale ales, you would see the pale ales increasing in popularity. But instead, because marketing is what marketing is, IPAs continue to be on fire. Um, I do think that in general, more sessionable beers are definitely something people are looking for. So the the, the really high ABV beers that American brewers have been invented, and experimental with, and cranking out. Um, they are interesting, but they are not session gold. You can't drink a ton of them. They knock you on your butt. Um, so they're a great nightcap, but they're never going to be a huge amount of volume just because they are so strong. If you want something that strong, you know, there's wine and spirits and all kinds of other categories that are there for you. So it always befuddled me a little bit that beer wanted to try to like, capture a little bit of that market. Um, that seems to be having a little bit in favor of more session gold beers. People are realizing, hey, if that beer is 4.1, Drink, you know, sort of beer all night. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you do. Um, and I'm going to say this too. Um, yeah. Uh, I guess just briefly, I think uh, we're going to agree that the uh, trend in the future will be uh, local, local ingredients, local hops, local uh, malt, uh, local rye, local corn, whatever you want. Know, and you guys can take as much as. So there's a, there's a huge need for uh, local ingredients, and it's going to create something really unique for the locality that uh, is grown in. So I guess the one thing that I'm curious about, and how it's going to impact our industry down the road, is the, um, the more the legalization of marijuana. I'm very curious to see what that does. Once this 
instead of drinking one, they're going to start standing on every one. They're going to, most likely, if you're healthy, they're going to fall on these two. It's a really good, but I think it's a great thing. Personally, I can't speak to these guys. I'm sure they might have a little difference of opinion for me. But the more people that know, the more people that will drink, the more business will do. That's, that's my personal opinion. He, he loves blue commercials. He thinks they're fat. <laughs>
available with the number of breweries that are opening under the farm bill to be able to produce that much rain and or hops in New York City? Uh, last year, I think there might have been uh, one uh, altar that was open. Uh, and there, and there's, there's at least 10 in the state right now that are proposed. Models. And the farm growing bill, I don't have those figures, but uh, I do believe that it is possible. You know, I guess the farm growing bill, 20% of your ingredients when you first start out has to be here. By 2024, 90% of your ingredients has to be here. Uh, so there, there's gray area there. Uh, it's going to be a challenge. Uh, right now we have some things that are growing in New York and growing outside New York to be malted and coming back. That's still considered New York, uh, but it was growing here. So uh, I'm up for the challenge. I think we can do it. Yeah, I, I think from a brewer's perspective, I, they kind of hold around 20%. I think that's attainable and sustainable. Uh, I think 90% is kind of pie in the sky. Uh, I'd love to see it. I'd love to see that much all the barley being grown in New York State. I'd love to see that much being harvested and malted in New York State. I'd love to see uh, a hop concern back from Ithaca down to Poughkeepsie that rivaled what used to be here. Um, with what Ted talked about, I mean, imagine your business losing 100% of its revenue for six months. How long is your business going to stay open? Uh, it's it's going to be a bumpy start for sure. But uh, I, I think if as time goes by, I think they're going to hopefully back down from that 90%. I'd like to see that. I think it would help the farm brewers really, really succeed. And even if you're not a farm brewer, you really want that farm brewer to really succeed. We're all in, you know, we're all cheerleaders for each other. Can we touch the follow up on that? keynote address uh, is preceded by the, the president of the, the Brewers Association getting up and kind of giving a state of the brewing industry report and he talks about how many breweries open and how many breweries close and up knows how many are brew pubs and, and on and on and on. It's just numbers to death. Um, an hour or an hour and a half is you get the best sleep when you're But it, it's an interesting picture. And, and then he, he kind of, as he was closing, he said, so for those of you who, you know, this is your first conference, I want you to look around the room. There's people around here who have hopped their homes and, and you know, put their lives on hold and their retirements on hold for years and, and reset their lifestyle and, and all that. And he kind of went on in great description. And he said, and look around at all these people. And if not for yourself, then for them, don't um, goof it up. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't goof. It wasn't goof. No. It's a word that didn't end with that. <laughs> um, but as you know, I have an old guy in the brewing industry. You know, I, I'm you know, happy to hear that. Um, and I think as the young guys in the industry who are interested in getting into this, because they're good brewers because they want to brew good beer, not because, wow, this is like an awesome business model, we can like hang out and like have some awesome beer, and then like, <laughs> go longboarding after we have some awesome beer. <laughs> um, and and there's, there's a lot, there's a lot. I mean, we don't see it so much in Buffalo. I don't know if the snow prevents it or not, but uh, you, you don't really see that. But when I came home from Colorado, I said to my wife, if I never hear or see somebody with a free hair goatee again, it'll be too soon. <laughs> Maybe that's just my name. I'm sorry. Um, there's a lot of talk in the press about uh, the great success of microbreweries leading to uh, the next wave of micro distilleries. Uh, do you see that as sort of a natural progression, uh, or is that a very different thing? <laughs> Uh, distilling is tough because you've got basically 
you've got to make beer first, or something like that. You've got to make your yeast food first. So you've got to be able to do that, and then you've got to be able to ferment it, and then you've got to be able to distill it, and then you've got to have the patience of Job while it ages. Um, I just don't have that kind of patience. You know? So, uh, you know, start up. Pardon? Five years startup? How about 11 years startup? I mean, you, you look at some of the whiskeys that are out there that people are talking about, and these things were made when I was in high school. Yeah. And that was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, you know, the distilling thing, I, I think it's, it's a natural follow through. I mean, it, it is. You're, you're talking about a brain, you're talking about fermenting, you're talking about uh, beverage alcohol, you're talking about all those things. Uh, but it's just, it's, it's the aging time, it's the turnaround. Look at the number of wineries that, that will put a shovel in the ground and start to grow some grapes and, and never see the light of day. Uh, a good distillation is going to be longer than that. So I, I think that's going to be the struggle. I think it's a great idea um, if, you know, the, I think in an ideal world, they would allow a distiller and a brewer to pair up because now you've got a distiller who could focus on distilling and let the brewer make them their distillate. I don't know if that will happen, but I, that looks great. In Colorado they do it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Old Contrero. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so there's some great stuff. There's some great synergy to be had, but in New York State you've got to be separate, like by a lot. Um, if, if there were some partnerships allowed, you know, even to do the, a farm... Well, that, if the farm brewing license... Farm brewing can do a distillery? Farm, yeah, if the farm brewing license, you can have a distillery, a, a winery, a cidery, and all in the same building, on the same property. Yeah, it's, it's been the opposite. The wineries have been able to do that kind of forever. Uh, if you apply for a farm winery license, you could then open a brewery, and you could then open it, whatever you wanted to do. Exactly. Once you yeah, once you apply for a brewer's license, you were done. You were only ever going to be a brewer. That's all I really have time for is being a brewer. I just don't have time. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, everyone.